welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, I wanted to thank all of our attendees for joining us during their lunch hour here uh, in, on the East Coast and for I imagine for some of you what's your dinner hour over in the UK as well. Um, we're really excited about today's session, GeoThink and Learn 10 on citizen science and crowdsourcing. My name is Drew Bush, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher with GeoThink at McGill University in the Department of Geography. Um, and today's convener for our session is GeoThink collaborator Muki Hackley, a professor of GI science in the Department of Geography at University College London and head of the Extreme Citizen Science or Excites group. Um, just by way of mentioning, Muki also recently taught a really excellent course on citizen science um, for UCL. And if you're interested, that's actually online through their online extension. Our other panelists include Dr. Victoria Slonowski, who's the principal organizer for Acre Canada and the Data Rescue Archives and Weather Project. Her forthcoming book will be published by the University of Chicago Press and is called Climate in an Age of Empire. And our third speaker today is Dr. Karen Cooper, a research associate professor at North Carolina State University. She's also the author of the recently published and really excellent book, um, speaking from having read it myself, on citizen science entitled Citizen Science, How Ordinary People Are Changing the Face of Discovery. Um, so just a brief note for those of, uh, those of us who are joining us as attendees today on how you can participate in today's session before I turn it over to our convener, Dr. Hackley. Um, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, uh, depending on what kind of device you're working, it will be at the bottom of your screen or at the top of your screen, that there are a couple different buttons. Um, one that you'll see is a Q&A button. So we ask that if you would like to ask questions of the panel in written form, that you actually can ask your questions in this, um, in this box here. You can ask them anonymously, so please be aware that today's session is being recorded and it will be posted on our website and further disseminated after today. So if you um, don't want your name appearing in the session, please make sure you use the anonymous option. Um, of course, you are welcome to use your name as well. You can also chat with our panelists and with other attendees and myself if you open the chat panel. Um, so that chat is a way that you might ask more informal questions as well. Our speakers will be answering, of course, your Q&A questions in written form, but also in our session when we get to the Q&A part of today. The last option that you'll see is a button that says raise your hand. Um, if you would like to take part and share your video in our session today and ask a question verbally of our speakers, you're also welcome to do that. By raising your hand, I'll actually get pinged over on my side of Zoom, and then I'll promote you to be a panelist to, to share your screen and to ask your question. So a warm welcome once again for today's session, which I think is going to be quite exciting. And I will turn it over now to Dr. Hackley to convene our session. Um, thank you very much, Drew, and welcome everyone to this session. Um, we are going to look at citizen science today from different perspectives, of um, especially environmental perspective, but uh, because of the connection to GeoThink, we will think about how that works with government, local, and other um, spatial units and uh, jurisdiction. So I will start with a short explanation about my take on citizen science and environmental um, policy making, looking at the uh, picture more generally. Um, and you should see the screen right now. Yes. So uh, what I'm going to cover in the next eight minutes is um, talking quickly over the main aspects when we're trying to think about citizen science and environmental policy making. And I made uh, a while ago the point that we can think about three eras of environmental information and the public role within that. So uh, 1969 is commonly marking the beginning of the uh, legislation 
in the environmental area, we the National Environmental Policy Act in the US, but there are other examples that follow quite quickly around this area. Silent Spring was before that, uh, Earth Day was just after that. And in that period, what you see is that actually the whole environmental debate is something that there is public awareness, but actually the information and the issues are being defined by expert and they might argue with other experts. So you have a water expert arguing with a quality expert. They might agree or disagree and they pass the information over to decision makers who then might talk with the public or disagree with them or claim that just the public has a NIMBY issue and therefore they can be ignored. Um, and in that period, what we can see is that uh, experts responsible for creating environmental information, advising the government, we see a lot of top-down attitude to environmental decision-making. The view toward the public is something that became to be called the information deficit model. So if the public knew what the expert knew, they would do exactly the same thing. Um, although not taking into account any local knowledge and understanding. And it was seen as environmental information and decision making by expert for experts. The next period, which is marked from around 1987, you've seen in the previous slide, which is when a report called Our Common Future that actually defined sustainable development came out. Um, or more accurately, 1992, when the Rio Earth Conference, which was a big international gathering in the environmental area, set in motion something called Principle 10, which uh, talked about public access to environmental information, has moved things into a situation where you see a new arrow, the arrow that is marking the sharing of information with the public. So in that period, you have uh, in the beginning something called this uh, principle 10 about public access to environmental information, uh, public participation in decision making and uh, access to justice. And that evolved into a major convention in um, the area of Europe, but in many other areas around the world around the same principle the public need to access information in order to participate in activities and there is understanding the civic society organization as a role and information can be shared on the web but information is mostly shared in experts form so if you understand all the uh, scientific information you can join in if not then tough luck um, and actually since 2005, we are moving into a new era and we're seeing also that uh, the public is starting to produce information. So we've seen it through uh, activities like I on Earth uh, that started with the European Environment Agency, allowing the public to report uh, water observation in beaches, but then also we've seen all the activities that fall under the banner of citizen science people recording information about their environment, pollution, other things, and they're starting to be included in different areas of decision-making. Not that easily, but what we are getting in this era is benefiting from the societal transition. So both the fact that we have many uh, more people with higher education, we have longevity of healthy life, we have increase in leisure time, plus the web and the mobile phone and all the rest of it that allow people to share their information and that's why we are talking about that and we also see more and more integration into legislation um, and operational program of uh, citizen science but we also need to think about how citizen science is integrated into the different stages of the policy cycle a lot of times citizen science is just perceived as data collection, data generation. And actually, you can look at the whole policy cycle. So agenda setting, which is uh, even uh, identifying new policy issues or gathering the data in order to demonstrate that it is an issue. Policy formulation, where people can talk about different policy options and you can have the more discursive form of citizen science, even citizen juries where people are getting involved in judging uh, scientific information, 
that are integrated there, then the decision making, lots of time that the big world will see less participation naturally, but we will see a lot of activities in the policy implementation and evaluation, and those are the usual area where we see citizen science active. So let's look at examples from the two areas. So one of the first cases when citizen science term was used ever was in 1989 when there was an acid rain campaign by the Audubon Society. And actually what they've done is that, as you can see there in the report, they had 225 volunteers across the US collecting water samples and demonstrating that there is an issue. That was generating the evidence that will allow the society to make the case for policy making and it did lead to changes in the regulation. So we can see that it's got a role even early on in that area. And there is also an example from policy formulation. So for example, in the Doing It Together Science project that we are currently running uh, with funding from the European Union, we are doing something called discovery trips, which bring different policymakers to experience what it's like to see citizen science operating in different areas. And we had a Polish delegation coming and seeing example from the UK, and then going back and actually implementing a campaign in their own area. We can also think about the different geographical scales of citizen science. So uh, also the, um, think about it, the ge geographical scales that are influenced but different areas, we can think about also that it's effective in local, city, and regional, and national scale. We less see citizen science in a regional scale. And also that, that as you move up the scale, naturally you will see more ICT being used much more uh, in this area. So uh, finally, I'll finish with an example from the UK, which is showing the, the, the issue with uh, citizen policy. So on one side, the UK is a fantastic place in terms of the activities. There are really a lot of long running activities. Uh, there is uh, the ecological recording, which is here called biological recording, which exists for many, many years and running for a long time. There are all kinds of innovations. So universe and galaxies have started here. There are systems like iRecord that allow recording. There are large scale projects like Open Air Laboratory or Capturing of course, which is dealing with uh, marine. Um, the RSPBB Garden Bird Watch that involves 500,000 people a year. And we have operational integration both in the BBC weather activities and in the meteorological office. So it seems like it's a fantastic environment. But then you look at it and you see that actually there are cost of this legacy. So first of all, researchers are so used to integrate with it that they don't always see it as part of research and that's a long story. So you see kind of some projects are funded by the lottery, other are having to go on crowdfunding. There is a lack of strategic integration into policy because you have the gatekeepers in different places that kind of provide the, the key to it. So only in the Scottish environment protection agency, you say integration. And if you look at the information flow, it's, it's a delightful mess of sharing data and protocol and organizational boundary that makes it actually challenging in terms of the integration. So you see both sides. Uh, you already mentioned the course, so if you want to see more, we have this online course, which you can find on UCL Extend and cover actually in a specific section of it, environmental citizen science, where you'll find much more than what I can do in eight minutes. And that's our website, and thank you to everyone who funded us. So that's uh, my talk, and now I'll pass the pattern over to Victoria to tell us about her experience in the whole area of uh, data salvage. Over to you, Victoria. There we go, unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Miki. Well, yes, from that grand overview, I feel we're gonna be very uh, local uh, for our project here, which is about citizen science and um, 
not data gathering so much as data transcription. So I'll be talking about the draw project at McGill, which is data rescue archives and weather. So let's see, is this, there we go. I'm, I'm sorry, I have a lot of panels open, so I'll try to make sure I can see my screen as well as the panels. So um, this is not about going out and collecting data in the field, the way many of uh, Miki's projects were, were describing. This is about trying to rescue the legacy data a little bit that Miki was talking about. So the big question is, well, why rescue historical data? Why are we interested in data from the past? Uh, and I'd say that in geosciences, and actually in a lot of so other sciences as well, such as uh, ecology, bird watching, uh, ocean monitoring, those kinds of things, just about everything that is related to earth sciences. The earth is our laboratory. We can't go and run other experiments uh, in the laboratory, we can construct models, and models are excellent. But we, um, there we go. But all our experiments happen in real time, which is partly why we want citizen scientists to go out in real time and collect data in real time, uh, which is a lot of what the, the current citizen science projects are. The flip side of that, though, is that to build up any kind of database, we need to go back in time which means going back to the historical records. So for weather in Canada, uh, our first weather observations actually go back to the mid 18th century. So some of our first records go back to uh, 1742 in some of these first um, recorded instrumental observations of weather here. So some of you uh, I'm sure must might know the old weather uh, project, which was to a citizen science effort to digitize weather logs or weather information from ship's logs. Uh, old weather as well as the citizen science projects are uh, run here in Canada. Uh, an earlier version of DRAW was run in 2010 to 2014, as well as all the information from um, National Meteorological Services have worked to type in a lot of information from the past and put these together into numerical weather prediction models to try and give us a view of past weather. So I don't know if any of you out there are uh, fans of or have read the books of The Little House on the Prairie, but the winter of 1880 has an entire book all to itself. It was such a, it was a really, really long, hard winter with piles and piles of snow and snowstorms. And I've actually spent so much time talking that I missed showing you the film. But uh, if you had a look at this, you could see all these, uh, all these, um, black waves are waves of snowstorms that were going across the ocean. These yellow dots, well, I'm pointing with my fingers, but of course you can't see. The yellow dots in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, those were moving back and forth. Those were the data that were collected from old weather on ships. So the ships were like moving observatories, collecting the weather information. And the gray area, the light gray area, you can see to the sort of top uh, left-hand side, that is where we don't have enough information. So that is where we still need more, more data, more weather information so that we can put it together and um, get more information about what was going on, what were the dynamics, what was the climate happening of, um, of these past weather events. So DRAW is uh, part of GeoThink and this is our, our soon to be launched citizen science platform to try and rescue the weather records from the McGill Observatory. So the weather records from the McGill Observatory, they, they were as uh, my colleague Frederick Kirby likes to say in Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, they were never meant to be public records. These were private records by scientists, for scientists with tons of um, jargon, which means they have, they're handwritten, they are in ledger forms, they have symbols. If you can see to your, the sort of the, the left-hand side there, these little crown symbols and Roman numerals. These are for Aurora symbols. We have to find some way of trying to transform these handwritten symbols, crowns, Roman numerals, uh, and all sorts of other complicated things into a database, which we are trying to do uh, with citizen science. So why citizen science? Because there are hundreds thousands, millions of data points that are in these historical documents. So that little movie I showed earlier of the winter of 1880, the, this page from before is one tiny, tiny sample. There are millions of data points that went into making that little uh, 30 second clip. It's not trivial. It's a huge 
backlog of information that needs to be uh, typed in. It is also underfunded. In meteorology, for example, in climatology, uh, when people go to pitch projects, you have a satellite versus typing in old records. Guess which is going to win? The satellite is uh, a lot more interesting and uh, tends to get a lot more excitement from the, uh, the funding agencies. Uh, so I, if I have a chance to talk about this later on, um, one of the things that I was interesting is uh, me personally and quite a number of people, especially in this area of data rescue because it's underfunded, are kind of back and forth in terms of professional science and citizen science. A lot of people working in this do this when they're retired. They do this on the weekends. They do it at their kitchen table. Um, even Philip Rohan, who runs Old Weather, I think, uh, as I said, many of you might know that, he has allocated, I think, 10% of his time to work on old weather. His actual job is to do other things for the UK Met Office. So that is one reason why he might be hard to get hold of if some of you are trying to get him, uh, then get hold of him. He's not actually allowed to work on this for very much of his time. And he is one of the people who actually is allowed to work on this and many other people are not allowed, not allowed, I'm saying allowed, but, but you do use their own time, their own money, their own finances, their holiday time to go to archives to, to do this kind of work. Um, and I was interested in this, actually, I had a, a, a personal enlist which made me unable to work and able to actually hold a pen and type. And of course, typing is really behind uh, the kind of thing we need to do here. So I was looking for something to do and I find uh, LibriVox, which is a cousin of the Gutenberg project, which I don't know if some of you may know. This is to um, type up and uh, uh, out of copyright books, and LibriVox was a sister organization to read these books into audiobook format for people who are blind or uh, otherwise uh, were interested in using audiobooks. So I couldn't type, but I could speak. So I got started in volunteering for LibriVox, and then from LibriVox, I got the inspiration to start a citizen science project to try and type up all these boxes and boxes of uh, historical rec records, which by this time were sitting in my attic for several years. So that's where the, um, the initial inspiration for the original Canadian Data Rescue Project came from, which was Acre Canada. So it ran for four years. We got about half a million observation types up. Um, there were about 12 stalwart volunteers. There were more people who were interested. I would say there was a ratio of maybe one to five, maybe even one to 10 of people who contacted and said they were interested versus people who actually sat down and, and typed in data. So that was, uh, it's quite interesting in terms of the statistics there. And then that eventually led us on to draw. And as I mentioned earlier, so the, the boundary between the professional and citizen scientist is really not clear. It's quite, quite blurred. We don't really have, in this field anyway, we don't really have sort of the professional scientist on one side and the citizen scientist on the other. It's, it's, a, it's very much a, a, a circle. So um, just to show so some of the, the results as well as the, the video I showed earlier, this is literally hot off the graphics generator, not, not a press anymore, but I was working on this this morning. Um, so I was working on a paper, I was asked to write a paper about weather hazards and how weather hazards have changed. So here we have weather hazards in Quebec and Montreal, which has been generated by uh, the data that were typed up by these citizen science volunteers. So the points on the extreme left of the top hand graph, those come from the, the picture I showed you at the very top from 1742. Uh, and the data uh, in the middle uh, are mostly the, from the historical observations and the weather diaries that were typed up by volunteers. And the big white spaces between the 1870s and the 1950s, that is what DRAW is for. That is what we're hoping DRAW will fill in um, to give us some knowledge to, to fill in these gaps in the middle. And then finally, I just had a little graphic and I, I was gonna put some little arrows and circles, but I couldn't figure it out how to do that on PowerPoint. Between um, how on the one hand we have sort of what we call domain scientists who retire, or who may be trained in meteorology or, and worked in it for a while, but then uh, a, few, a few of the people on our project were stay-at-home mothers, a few became entrepreneurs and were running their own businesses. Uh, some were even in the army and had downtime uh, when they were deployed in various locations. And we also had a few people on the other side who were citizen scientists and through citizen scientists gained the expertise to then go ahead and actually get employment in various fields. So it actually goes, goes both ways. Um, you do have experts who become citizen scientists, but you also have citizen scientists who then go on and become experts as well. So, so that was an interesting experience in this. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And now we'll hear from our final speaker, Dr. Karen Cooper.
Do you want to unshare that screen? Okay. Great. Hi from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so I, uh, anyway, I'm just going to mention that I'm, I have this dual affiliation. So I, I'm at NC State University in this, uh, what's called the cluster in public science and jointly appointed at the Museum of Natural Sciences, where my lab, my students and I work behind a glass wall where all the visitors can watch. And I'm at neither location today, I'm <laughs> just home. <laughs> anyway, and, and then I'm also affiliated with SciStarter. And what I wanted to talk about today um, was really just one area that I'm grappling with in the design of citizen science uh, projects, um, which was related to geoprivacy and openness. Um, but to start, I just wanted to say that what I really like about citizen science is that it really challenges us to, I think, to think differently about um, knowledge production systems and about conventional science and about like it just lets us call into question all these things about who has expertise about hierarchies in science elitism all these different things which I think come to light as we start to think about citizen science and for me what I'm particularly interested in is the relationship between scientists and citizen scientists which is not as Vicki was pointing out not always like a distinct line and um, and sort of how much citizen scientists um, adopt the norms of conventional science or how much they really are in different roles and might need some protections. So um, anyway, so with this, uh, like I said, I'm interested in this tension between um, geoprivacy and by that I mean um, the right to determine how, if and when, one's personal location information is shared with others and openness, which by that I mean like the open science movement, a movement to make scientific research, data, publications, and everything accessible to everyone, amateurs and professionals. And then just to be clear by citizen science, you know, we're really talking about lay people, or you know, in some form or another, explicitly sharing information for research and often implicitly sharing some personal information, including location information, right? So I have a background. I come to this from ornithology originally. Um, you know, so there's citizen scientists that share information about the location of a bird that they've seen. And they're doing that explicitly. And then of course, implicitly, because they saw it, right? They're sharing information about their location. And it's often their home. Um, and, and I think that, uh, well now, um, you know, with the open science movement, there's a lot of journals, for example, that require open data archiving or public data archiving, right? And um, yeah, anyway, and of sharing this information that people have shared with projects that they trust for specific purposes. And these other, I mean, the openness, right, of course, is for sharing for lots of good reasons of reproducibility and reuse and whatnot. But anyway, but it's not always explicit to participants who have contributed those data. And then, of course, now there's the new um, European Union uh, general data protection regulations that have come out, the revisions, you know, which definitely provide a lot of different protections for um, all kinds of different privacy. And I think that it's still, it's pretty unclear what that means for citizen science and the way current citizen science projects are designed um, and especially how they're linked to open data practices. And so um, anyway, that's one of the, it's where I'm interested in right now. And what it means for citizen science, I think also relates to this other aspect which is that people learn from their participation in citizen science projects. And this is one of Mookie's uh, typologies of learning outcomes. Uh, and so I hope you don't, I'm just using the first part of it, hope you don't mind, um, which in, basically, because there's been so many different documented learning outcomes from citizen science participation. And um, Mookie's lumped them into these categories, which I thought were pretty good, just like personal development, you know, gaining confidence, empowerment, whatever kind of stuff. Generic knowledge and skills, like about science, say, like, um, you know, general 
understanding the scientific process, critical thinking, and then project specific knowledge and skills like, um, you know, birders learning more about birds and how to identify them. And what I, and a lot of times these have been related to science, um, science efficacy, and maybe environmental type things. Um, I think, oh, I guess what I failed to mention. So that part of citizen science that I'm most interested in is really when it takes place with geographically dispersed um, people. So then all the interaction and all the exchanges is mediated by the internet. And so I think that, um, so one of the learning outcomes I think that's super possible in citizen science is to increase internet literacy, which I think is super necessary in this day and age. And this is just um, from a kind of what's now an old paper about the relationship between internet literacy and privacy concerns. And it's kind of a we this weird result that they got um, which is really just to say, we know so little, I think, about the relationship between internet literacy and privacy, um, because what they found was this negative relationship. So those who had more internet literacy had fewer privacy concerns. I, they even questioned that result. I actually question it too, because I think they were fitting a linear model to what's a nonlinear relationship. But anyway, the point is there's not a lot known, but I think that citizen science has the potential to be designed in ways that in increase internet literacy in ways that just help people um, increase awareness and understanding and hopefully their better decision making with regards to privacy. So anyway, what I'm hoping or what I'm planning really is some research in a new citizen science project that I'm designing um, that will offer both transparency and different privacy control options to volunteers. Um, so that we can see what they choose and then investigate why they chose those options and what they thought it meant. And um, I'm hoping that approach might be, okay, useful in citizen science. So just briefly, the project that I'm starting is recently funded from the EPA. The tentative title is Crowd the Tap. Um, it's about lead and tap water. Um, the citizen science aspect of it is uh, for people to provide information about the materials of their premise plumbing and their service lines. And that, um, and then also about water use and characteristics, you know, whether there it's a home, an apartment, whether they rent or own. And, and there's some risks with sharing that information. So in the US, people, renters and homeowners that are selling their home, they're required to disclose if the residence has lead paint. But for most states, it's not required to disclose anything about lead pipes. And there can be risks, like especially financial risks to property value in doing so. So it's kind of this issue about people wanting to share or not. Anyway, so what we're gonna do is set up options. Like this is just to compare, and we can do it because I'm doing it on the platform SciStarter. Um, this is a different project I have on that platform called Got Guts. And in this one, we don't give any options. We just have some transparency via our informed consent statement that people sign, which in this case, it basically says no options, you're gonna remain anonymous to us because SciStarter handles all the identifications of people, you know, who people are and whatnot and the registration. So when you share photos, we're not gonna give you any attribution to those photos if we share them. But with this new project, what we wanna do is give people a whole suite of options where they can control um, who they wanna share what with, both with their personal identity, maybe they only wanna share that with SciStarter and everything else is just a username or not even, it's just a, you know, a number, whatever. Um, and what they want to, who they want to share their location information with. And anyway, like I said, we can do that on SciStarter because we have a, there's a volunteer manager system so that still as project managers, we can message back and forth with people, but we can do so without them revealing their identity. Um, but they do have a profile page in SciStarter too, where they can make their different options, information about them, public or private. Um, and then again, with the Got Guts project that we've started there, or with that SciStarter interface projects, um, it's a mashup, I guess, with um, OpenStreetMap. And right now people can just put in the exact location that they're reporting on, um, but we could provide an option where they just are clicking to a block grid. Although in my limited knowledge of geoprivacy, I'm learning that that might give a false sense of privacy protection. Um, Anyway, and what I'm learning too is that there's a lot of different methods to obfuscate location when sharing that back out. 
but that none of them are really foolproof either. So anyway, I'm just curious to get feedback on what people think about sort of this both research option and citizen science design option about offering transparency and different levels of control of private data um, in a citizen science context. So I'd like feedback. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. And um, just a, a brief reminder for everybody before we turn it over fully to our Q&A session, um, there are three ways that you can take part in our Q&A. So just to, a reminder, at the bottom of your screen, um, you'll see a tab for Q&A. You can pose questions there for our panelists in written form. Um, you'll see a couple that are already coming in. You can, if you would like, make them anonymous since this entire session today will be recorded and, and disseminated. Um, the other option, of course, is to chat in our chat books with our panelists or with other, and with the attendees in the audience. And of course, if you'd like to share your video screen and ask your question verbally, um, please click the button that says raise your hand and I'll get pinged to actually promote you to be sharing your screen. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that if you're on a, a tablet or mobile device, you should have all three of these options as well. So feel free to message me in our chat if you're having any difficulty if you're on one of those types of devices. So thanks again to our panelists for really interesting presentations. And I'd actually like to, to start it off with a question that I think um, was implicit in, in all three of our presentations and definitely was something, Karen, that you were dealing with explicitly. And, and for, for those of us who are, who are maybe not experts in citizen science, but are thinking about what the role is that citizens play, so that first word in the citizen science, um, I'm wondering if you can talk about the different roles that citizen scientists play in the types of projects that you're familiar with or the ones that you're perhaps working on. Um, and as well, what types of, of benefits you see citizens who take part in those projects deriving from them. And I know, um, Mookie, that you have written a typology paper, I believe, on this subject too. So I'll start us with that question. So Karen, you first. <laughs> um. Okay, there's a lot of layers to that question. Uh, so in terms of the roles of people participating, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, so <laughs> there's citizen science projects that span a whole bunch of different, like, I guess, designs that engage people in different ways in the project, like in the most fundamental, you know, is uh, data collection um, or data transcription, and then, and then that's like, I guess, the, in some ways, the lowest bar to entry for anybody, you know, it's like, because um, often it's, it might not even take that much time. Often it dovetails with some hobby or activity or interest or concern that they already have. Um, so a lot of times, yeah, the citizen science project activities can dovetail really well when in that case. Um, and then there's other ways that people participate. Um, which, I mean, Mookie touched upon, you know, related to forming questions, um, analyzing results, and, you know, the whole, uh, everything, doing all the aspects of science. Um, and, I mean, my, the work that I do is always contributory style citizen science, so it's, it always tends to be this, uh, where people are just, are sharing observations and they're geographically dispersed. It's information that no one scientist could collect by themselves. Um, and so, yeah, but there's so many different designs. Um, and, and with that, which I think relates to one of the questions there, the, well, I'll just stop there so that other people can answer. I can go on and on, <laughs> sorry. So, so I'll, I'll build on that and it's kind of uh, lucky that in the, this chat, you got two kind of expansionist in terms of approach to what we define as roles and as things that are included in citizen science. Actually, it's fantastically illustrated in Karen's book, which is fantastic. Um, 
And the point about this thing is to to remember that that especially for people that come in from very structured views of participation and kind of assume that only when you are having full control over the process, that's meaningful participation, everything else is not. This is a wrong way of thinking about citizen science. So you need to offer a lot of opportunities for different roles and allow for different journeys through the process of doing that. So the, the nice thing about citizen science, because a lot of people are doing that for this kind of public goal of producing scientific information and shared human knowledge, is that people do people sometimes want to do that, but they don't have all day to sit and figure out weather records. So they want to do something really quickly and then move to the next thing. And sometimes it is to click on the penguin in Penguin Watch. And other times someone wants to run something in the background. Sometimes they want to do the whole things and design the process. And it will be even in, in different stages in life, different time of the week, different times of the year people would want to do different things. And actually that's one of the most powerful aspects that, that exists within the citizen science. Now there are people within the, this kind of growing scientific field of citizen science that, that actually argue that there should be a strict definition of what it is citizen science and that certain things, just because they don't define it as their citizen science, shouldn't be defined as citizen science. So, um, Karen and I disagree on that. I think we share we share an understanding that that's that's just wrong. But I let Karen say if I'm wrong. Karen, I don't, I don't know if you wanted to comment more on Amuki's last thought or. Can, so unfortunately, I was responding, starting to respond to one of the Q and A questions, and I missed that last bit. So, what is it that we disagree on? Okay, no. So, so what I've said is that the things that we both disagree that the type of people who try to squeeze it in science with a very accurate definition of what is and what isn't kind of make a lot of people outside these things. Like the most classical thing is is to claim that volunteer computing is not citizen science. And, and that's just so obviously wrong that, right. that you don't know where to start. Right. Well, I do agree with you with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I've said. We, we agree on. But that's like, if you had different configuration of people, you might have had, you know, more debate on that. Yeah. Well, the whole terminology thing is an issue anyway. And it was funny you used the Audubon example for the first use of citizen scientists because of their recent statement that they are not going to use the term citizen science anymore and only call it community science. But they're only changing the name to community science. They're not changing the actual practice to actually be community science. So there you go. <laughs> but it's just a name. <laughs> and yeah, and it's fuzzy boundaries. So. Interesting, yeah. So maybe I'll turn to a question now that I, I noticed um, our, Victoria has has wanted to speak to orally, and it was posed in our our Q and A session, or in our Q and A box, I should say. Um, and I think this is a question that's important when we think about citizen science and the types of data that that citizens might be contributing. In particular, um, an anonymous attendee asked of Victoria, "Do you have any idea of the data quality for the old records, and do they provide scientists with information that they cannot?" generate elsewhere. So when we're thinking about this historical data, I know, of course, accuracy is another concern for citizen sign projects of all types, if other speakers want to talk about that as well. So maybe, Victoria, if you can start us. Sure. Um, so the answer to both questions uh, that is there uh, is yes. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about with citizen science recently is uh, how the power of computing has really changed the face of it because not only do we have the internet so we can con uh, connect with people, but we can actually amass these huge data sets. So one of the things we can do with these huge data sets is we can also run lots of statistics on huge data sets. And I was able to do that on some of these um, various statistics and frequency analyses and things like that, which I, was, I published in 2014. And I was really astonished when I was able to compare for temperature distributions, for example, to see how closely they matched um, when you had a look at what you would expect the thermometers to give and things like that. 
uh, it was astonishing how well they reproduced the expected distribution. It, I was even able to tell how the thermometers were calibrated, whether they're calibrated to two degrees Fahrenheit um, based on, on the a statistical analysis of these this information because we were able to get it at such a fine scale. We're able to look at every hour, every observation, every hour. We so we have on the one hand, it's a challenge because we have hundreds of thousands of observations. On the other side, because we have hundreds of thousands of observations, we have such a big data set that we can really analyze it and get an idea of the data quality. And um, so that was a little bit suspicious. It's like, oh, these all look so good. Maybe it's just maybe just because the, the data are, are something to do with the data. And then I came across one that did not look good at all. And halfway through the manuscript, I found, oh, I left the thermometer in the sun at noon. So it was, it was really good the way we were able to use the statistics to verify what was in the manuscript. And then also the manuscript to sort of look back at the statistics and explain why we had these discrepancies. So it was, it was a very nice double check to look at just the, the statistical value without referring to the historical context and then look at the historical context and be able to trace that back to the, the, the statistical value. So it's like a, a, almost like an independent check. Uh, and the other half of that question was, do they provide scientists with information they can't get elsewhere? And absolutely yes, that is why they are so very precious. Um, in terms of actual weather observations, in many places they, they didn't really start regularly until the late 1900s and in other places even until well into the 20th century. So these private weather records are all we have going back uh, in time. And, and in many places, they're unique. Uh, they're in, in, in location, they're not repeatable. It also makes it a little bit difficult for quality because we only have one, so we don't have anything to check it against. But um, yeah, for both questions, uh, yes, we can do quality and yes, they are absolutely uh, vital because we cannot get the information elsewhere. Yeah, and maybe I can broaden the question slightly for, for Mookie and Karen. Um, with the projects that you're involved with, I know that one thing that is often talked about or, or thought about is the quality and the accuracy of the data versus how unique it is or how important it is not being able to get it elsewhere. Is, can maybe speak to that a little bit. Okay, so I'll, I'll go first on that one. Um, in terms of the data quality, I have my more generous approach to why scientists are, are uh, not liking it and the less generous approach. So I'll start with the generous one. The main, the main reason that, that I now explain what's going on is the difference between scarcity and abundance that scientists and, and government bodies are used to condition of scarcity where they have limited budget and therefore you want to get your observation once and really, really well because it's so, so what you end up with is more and more expensive instrument and then you have really qualified staff that know how to operate the instrument and then it becomes very expensive to send them to check a, a stream because they need, so you get them a really good 4 by 4 and then they go and do the sample and come back but you really can't have them all, everywhere and every time. So you need to also have a very careful sampling approach and you don't collect everything uh, across a large area. And when you're used to that mindset, you are operating in a specific way, the top down, well designed, and we all know that it's not always working, but in general, that's, that's the way you approach it. Whereas in citizen science, you kind of need to change all the mindset because once you have abundance, which means a lot of observers, which you have less control over where they are, but they are doing lots of things and can integrate with lots of things, then suddenly you can have, for example, for Victoria Weather Records, three people recording the same information. They are not wasting the time, they're actually doing peer review, which the scientists are supposed to do, but they don't have the human resource to do. So actually, and there is a really interesting paper that argues that epistemologically, this approach is better scientifically than what you know, the paid scientists do, and that's kind of analyzing it on galaxies. So, so that's kind of a change of mindset that, that a lot of scientists that grew up, grew up in, in a scarcity condition find extremely difficult 
to, to take in. Then exactly what Victoria also raised is really critical here that, that because of this difference, you need to approach it statistically different. So in ornithology, I learned that since the 1940s, they have methodologies to deal with the fact that it's not sampled, but kind of different distribution and how to fill in the area and how to start thinking about the biases. So areas that got used to it develop the methods to do that and require you to think to think differently. Now to, to the less generous answer, and actually it does appear now, and I had enough examples to say that it's not just me being nasty, is that uh, scientists are concerned about their position and their status in society. And a lot of them think that while putting down citizen science, they secure their position. And one easy way to do that is to say, this is crap data quality and only someone experienced like me can do it properly. Now it's, it's coming from lots of reasons. I can understand where it's coming from. Don't like it. Karen, if you will. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'll just build on what you were saying, the both of you were saying about how it requires different approaches to statistics. Um, and I think that extends too to like regulation and how we, that's approached too, because like currently a lot of like environmental regulation or pollution um, type stuff is based on monitorings of these like, like yeah, a lot of money going into like very few, very high quality, like air quality monitoring devices say, that you know, are in one location that represents like a huge geographic area and over, you know, integrating that over a long time frame. And now we have a situation where you can have like tons of ob observers out there using low cost sensors or whatnot, so much more information that might be, you know, uh, collected at a different, um, I don't even know if I want to say quality, but just different parameters with it, different precision or whatnot, and, uh, or accuracy. And yeah, and then the statistical approaches to that are really different. And that's going to have implications, I think, for, um, yeah, just rethinking sort of regulatory approaches to it as well. Thank you, guys. And um, so I want to shift gears slightly now and, and move to a question that was actually sent to us over email in anticipation of this session. Um, and the shifting gears part is sort of moving from this issue of data quality that I think is of concern to scientists and thinking a little bit from the, the educational side. So this question was sent to us from one of our attendees who is from Ignite in the UK. Um, and in particular, bear with me, I'll read the, the first paragraph where he says that one topic that came up in the recent meeting of the Education Working Group of the European Citizen Science Association is around the synergies and benefits to be explored by applying citizen science principles and practice in different learning and education contexts. So both in schools and via informal science learning. And he, he goes on to say, within the context of education and discoveries and investigations and research, may provide new knowledge for the participants, so for the learners, but this may not be entirely new or original research in the context of academia. And so he asks, from your understandings of the definitions of citizen science, does this matter? And so I, I believe that question is for, for everybody on the panel. So whoever would like to answer first. I mean, I think that there's, there's many uh, purposes for scientific inquiry, and there's scientific inquiry for advancing generalizable knowledge, like, yeah, research, whether it's basic or applied. And I think there's a lot of citizen science that is done that um, is not redundant with conventional science, ideally, right? So it, is, it advances research frontiers that could not be advanced any other way. Um, not not just rediscovering something that a scientific study could address. But having said that, there's also a lot of other uses with, citizen, with scientific inquiry for solving local problems, for addressing a local situation or a lo to applying that for like local purposes. Um, you know, because sometimes the generalizable knowledge still needs to be, still needs more information to make it make sense at a local level. So, I mean, I think there's give and take, but I, 
if what they're saying is is purely educational stuff citizen science it's not <laughs> so maybe i'm not quite understanding the question though um i mean there's environmental education and then there's th then there's scientific you know citizen science that is answering questions that wouldn't be addressed otherwise if i can just add, i'm not sure i followed the question particularly but does all does it ask if all citizen science has to be academically related well sorry let me let's see let me clarify by, by, by asking just the question part of the question again. So, okay. um, so there was a bit of a preface there, but um, what the, the writer was, was asking is that within the context of education, so all of the type of citizen science that might take place in an educational setting, um, the students or the learners in that context would be perhaps learning a lot of new things um but there might not actually be anything new contributed academically so in the sense of research or data there might not be any new information for how is that citizen science then is well, that what so they're asking that's, that's exactly what they're asking is you, would you consider I that would, the, what they're describing sounds like an inquiry based learning lesson mm -hmm. but there's tons of examples of citizen science projects in classrooms Hmm. Um, so, I, yeah, but I'll let others chime. Sure. And Victoria, I know you had started to speak there, so I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, I was just trying to um, parse out the question. Uh, I think there's a lot of science-based learning that can happen in education and that citizen science methods mm -hmm. can be applied there. Does it all have to be original research? Does it all have to involve an academic researcher? Um, that's the question. Well, that's the question, I guess. And that's the question is how much involvement is there for the completely amateur in the world of science? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's up to the individual. It doesn't all have to be, is our definition of science only what gets published in, in, in research journals or can it be um, outside that, I guess? Mm. There's plenty of uh, graduate students that never end up publishing. <laughs> well, and there's, there's plenty, plenty of, of science that's, that's not yet published. <laughs> there's plenty of science that goes on in blogs as well. It's at the, that's the other side, I guess, of the internet is it's breaking open the, the world of academia and science. So it's not, there's even plenty of science going, goes on in government that doesn't get published because it's uh, yes. for whatever reason. So that's, I would say that takes a very narrow view of science. <laughs> And that we don't need to take such a narrow view of science necessarily. For what that's worth. Sure. Okay. Well, let, we're we're coming up on on one o'clock, so let me um, pose a, a last question from our Q and A box. Um, question, I think that is, I think looking at sort of recent trends, and it, and this participant asks, how will things like artificial intelligence shape citizen science, and do computers reduce the number of potential projects out there or do they have a different type of impact? Sorry, I can speak to that for a little bit if, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, been, I've been working in this for um, two decades about or more and for two decades people have asked me, can't we do optical character recognition? <laughs> Um, and uh, for two decades, I've sort of been trying and optical character recognition uh, has been getting better. But the very first ones I tried to do it on were some printed tables from the 1780s. And, and, and the tables didn't quite line up because they were using printer blocks. And so the lines of the table were taken to be L's and ones were taken to be I's. And it, it took more time to correct it than it did to actually, it would have done to type the data in in the first place. And that, and um, that's kind of, so some things have gotten better with AI, but one of the reasons uh, with draw, for example, that we have to go to citizen science is that we need people to read this. Uh, at the moment, we, it might be possible to envisage training a computer to do this, but at this point, it would take so much time. We, we need a, a human brain to interpret 
the handwritten symbols and Roman numerals and characters and that kind of thing. So that's, that's why we actually need to turn to people and humans and citizen science for these transcription projects at the moment. So in what I'm doing, I do not see AI taking it over anytime soon. There, there is a lot of AI going on with photo, you know, with identifying, um, you know, animals in photos and things like that, like species identification and human machine learning, you know, where, where people making those classifications are helping train computers in being able to do it better. And, you know, and that's pretty exciting and everything, but I think there's also, there is concern about the loss of that natural history expertise that, that people have. Um, and that's super important too, because, and some people, you know, whatever, because yeah, people can take a photo of a salamander and not know what it is and sure, maybe rely on some AI to tell them what that salamander is, <laughs> but like it still requires people to have enough natural history knowledge to know where to go to look and to turn over logs and to like know where they're going to find things. So I think that there's always, whatever, people are not obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's definitely ways for leveraging those technologies together. Um, but I think one of the principles in citizen science too is to not waste people's time and not have people do, a, do tasks, especially micro tasks, that a computer could do. And Mookie, I didn't know if you had thoughts on that question too before we move to a final one. It's, it's been answered. <laughs> well, I, I don't have anything to add. Okay, great. So I, I think we'll we'll wrap up with one last question um, that I think really speaks to to the talk that Karen was giving. So I'm betting that this is aimed for for you. And uh, one of our participants, Edward Millar, asks um, with respect to the the privacy issues that you were raising, um, how do private personalized genetic companies like 23andMe fit into the picture? And is there a risk that the concept of citizen science can be used as perhaps even a marketing angle for for-profit companies that can, you know, benefit from people sharing this type of personal information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, first, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, let me reread it again. Um, Yeah, I mean, some people would consider 23andMe to be a citizen science project on a lot of those ones. I mean, people are sharing information intentionally, knowing that, that it's not just for them to get that information back, but that it is used for research. And yeah, and they're paying to have it done. And um, so, I don't know, I mean, I guess what's being suggested there is like, is that going to be like something that's exploited? And I don't necessarily think a company making a profit or be or charging for research aspects is necessarily problematic. Um, but I think just a the lack of understanding of potentially people not really like in a human subject setting is what this research is, is not really understanding and be able to consent in a way that um, is fully informed is really what you know the heart of the issue. And right now it's so ironic to me is that there's so many ways that we are, that people unwittingly are sharing lots of information that go to for-profit companies that's for their own market research and whatnot. And so I hope that at least if we start to raise that awareness um, and desire for that control in a citizen science context, it might really help motivate people to branch out more and think about all the unwitting ways <laughs> that they're, that you know, and to, and to demand control on that as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there is, I guess, potential for that exploitation. And I think it's, it's up to us to help, um, help people or help the whole movement to overcome that. So I will also add to that. So one, it's interesting that when, when I wanted to use uh, during the online course, an example, where I dig deep to the potential of both designing application for getting people to contribute geographical information. Um, the example that I'm using is actually Google Local Guides. It's 
beautifully designed. It's done extremely well. All the ins you can learn huge amount from looking at the way that it's encouraging participants to add information, to enroll into the project, give them the right prompt in the right location. In terms of VGI, it's really it's the biggest one now and it's doing it extremely well. Now to argue that someone that's getting into the higher levels of contribution, say like me, who at the moment kind of contributed something like 700 images to this project, is not knowing what I'm doing or not being aware that I'm kind of giving free information for Google, that is a bit insulting. There are different incentives, there are issues, for like for example, my personal view is that because it's contributed freely to Google, Google should have released it onto the community, but I also accept that, that at the moment they're using it in order to, to get the information in, in places where they don't have enough value. They don't, there isn't enough value in running street view cars all day long, all the time. Maybe one day when they'll run the whole world with autonomous cars, that will change. You know, talking about the AI back. But, but getting back to the whole things, we need to kind of, there, there, there are some uh, people, people and there have been some examples of complaining about the use of citizen science by company, but that, that kind of putting very clear the dichotomy that something that happened in universities is good and something that happened by private companies is bad is just not nuanced enough to kind of both appreciate the participants, the companies and the synergies between them. Thank you, Muki. And thank you, Karen. Um, I think those are both really insightful answers. Um, since we're coming to the end of our time together, I just wanted to, to wrap up. And um, first, I wanted to thank all of our attendees for joining us during their lunch hour or perhaps closer to their pre-dinner hour as well. We're really excited to have had you join us today. Um, and of course, I wanted to extend a very warm thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, it's very hard to, of course, schedule these types of sessions as we get into the summertime. And it's very, um, we're very appreciative that you're able to join us here today and to share your really insightful presentations. Um, I found them very interesting myself. And of course, I wanted to remind our attendees that they should check out the various things I mentioned at the beginning of our session. Um, so in particular, Victoria Slonowski's upcoming book or forthcoming book, which you can actually pre-order, entitled Climate in the Age of Empire. Um, Dr. Karen Cooper's already published book, Citizen Science, How Ordinary, Ordinary People Are Changing the Face of Discovery. And of course, our convener for today, who will in a moment offer his final thoughts on our session, um, his online course offered through University College London or UCL's Extend program, um, which you can take online. And um, so thank you to all of you for joining us today and for taking part in our session. Um, our next Geothink and Learn will be in June. We're still in the midst of planning that, so check back on our website for details on that. And a reminder to anyone um, who maybe has a friend who wasn't able to make it today, we will be recording and posting this session on our website. So please feel free to share it and to share it widely. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Muki for some final thoughts on today's session. Yeah, so, so it was interesting to note how rapidly the discussion about citizen science and understanding of how it works is, is progressing. This area is really evolving rapidly and, and gaining acceptance, which is fascinating to see. And I think that within the lifetime of geothink, you, you can see the transition that, that it's coming from just at the edges of VDI to something that is quite central to understanding. And it's something that I would suggest to people to continue and watch for. Thank you, Muki. And thank you to everyone today. I hope you have a good rest of your day.